Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, joint webinar of the two um, projects, Osmosa and EUSYSFLEX. So today we will share with you some very interesting insights, challenges, but obviously also solutions related to TSO-DSO coordination, and more in particular, what is the value of flexibility provision by distributed resources and how does it impact TSO-DSO coordination. We will have some academic presentations and these will be followed by um, real life cases from different demos that have been uh, almost finalized within these two projects. So the agenda of today, important to mention first is that this webinar will last two hours. You already might have followed other webinars from the Osmos and EOSYSFLEX project. These were only one hour and a half. This one is two hours. So don't leave us and stay for the entire duration of this uh, interesting workshop. So the agenda, we will start with an introduction of the technical coordinator of EOSYSFLEX, Marianne Evans, and the um, coordinator of Osmose, Nathalie Griset. Next, we have first uh, a topic one, which is the value of distributed flexibilities, where we have two more, uh, I would say, academic presentations, followed then by a session with the demonstrators. And we will finalize this uh, webinar with a Q&A session, where we have an additional guest, Tommaso Di Marco from Terna, and where we will answer both questions from the audience and also discuss some upcoming challenges related to the topic. Um, I would also invite everybody who is attending uh, this workshop to post your questions in the Q&A section so that after each presentation, we might answer one or two questions and some questions, we might even keep them for the end when we have our round table with all the speakers together. In case your question would not be answered uh, due to a lack of time, obviously we will come back to it and we will answer them by email. So don't be stressed if we cannot answer it real life during the webinar. I think that was it for me. I would like now to give the floor to uh, Marianne Evans, who will introduce the EUSYSFLEX project. Marianne, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, good morning, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the uh, EUSYSFLEX project. So if we can move to the first slides, uh, here's uh, are the facts and figures about the project and illustration of uh, the team and what we're doing. It's a low carbon energy uh, project, a large project with a funding of 20 million from H2020. Uh, it will it carries on for four years. We're in the last year of the project. It will end in February 2020 with a very large consortium um, of uh, 34 organizations from TSOs to DSOs, aggregators, and of course, research, research institutes and universities. And at the core of the project, we have seven demonstrations. Uh, three of them will be presented uh, today. So the objective, if we can move to the next slide, uh, yeah, the objective and the context of the UCSFLEX projects is to demonstrate uh, reliable and efficient flexibility solutions so that we can reach the energy uh, transition targets and integrate over 50% res in the European power system. Uh, in this figure, uh, you can see the context that we, we are addressing. Uh, it's a huge increase in system complexity as we um, progress towards 50% res um, in just 10 years, let's say from 2020 to 2030. Uh, it's a large challenge, which is due uh, in part to the change in the power mix, as you can see here on the graph. Uh, the, the change, the progress in, uh, in uh, the res share is uh, essentially due to an increase in variable sources of electricity, so namely wind and solar. Uh, we have also a uh, change in this time horizon between 2030 and if we carry on progressing until 2050 uh, towards a change in the demand side as well. 
with uh, electrification of heat and cooling and uh, also a huge change due to the electrification of mobility uh, through transports, uh, cars, but also trains. Uh, due also to smart living and uh, development in a lot of um, electronic appliances, which allow for um, managing the demand side and also large scale deployments of batteries and storage. As we can see, and this will uh, interest us in particular today, is a change also in the system structure. Uh, it was, uh, it still is, uh, a system in Europe which is predominantly centralized uh, with huge power plants providing not only energy but also the flexibilities in the system. And now we're moving with these new sources uh, to a system which is becoming much more decentralized. So uh, this is raising some issues and challenges in the power system uh, that we have studied and we're trying to address by providing many solutions. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, here is an illustration of what we did with the uh, scenarios of the use effects, so progressing towards over 50% res, so uh, 52 and 66% resi in the renewable ambition scenarios. And as you can see, what I was mentioning earlier on is a large share of these resi are variable res. You can see from the figure uh, of Europe that the share of res is of V res in particular is a bit different from country to country, but this leads to uh, different challenges. So high res scenarios translate in increasing levels of not only variable, but also linked to their nat nature distributed electricity sources. Um, they're essentially decentralized, localized where the resource is, wind and uh, solar, but also um, high levels of distributed flexibility sources because and these sources are collected at, are connected sorry in all voltage levels and as you can see in the little figure on the right of the screen which is illustrating three of the demos of the project you can see that many of the flexibility sources from variable res to grid assets to batteries to electric vehicles demand side response are connecting to are connected to low lower uh, voltage levels. So to operate reliably the future system, but also to unlock the full flexibility potential, coordination between the various system operators is key. If we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, we will show you today three of the demonstrations from the seven uh, industrial sky scale uh, demonstration of the project, which will illustrate the provision of system services by distributed sources. So, um, and namely that will be the Portuguese demonstration that you can see here on the bottom left of your slide. You can see, will, you will see also um, objective and results from the Italian demo and from the German demo. Uh, illustrating how the enhanced coordination between TSO and DSO can unlock the flexibility potential. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. That was a very uh, sharp introduction to the ESISFLEX project. Looking forward to the um, further discussion related to the demos. Now we continue with uh, a similar exciting project, the Osmosa project, and we have uh, Nathalie Griset from RTE, who is coordinating the project, who will now give also a short introduction. Nathalie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena, and good morning, everyone. So next slide, please. So the Osmos project is a project about flexibility. Um, so there are many possible definitions of flexibility. And our in the project is this one. So it's the power system's ability to cope with variability and uncertainty in demand, generation, and grid over different time scales. Um, it means that in the project, we think that uh, short-term issues are related to long-term issues, and those we want to, to study all together. Um, so as presented by Marianne previously, uh, the power system is evolving a lot, and thus we have new uh, needs of flexibility which are arising mainly due to the penetration of renewables and also to the electrification of demand. But fortunately, there is also um, uh, new sources of flexibility, 
like the storage, or like the flexibility of renewable of the demand and also of the grid. And thus in our project, uh, we try to, to see how we can address the new needs of flexibility with the new sources um, in the most effective uh, way. So the consortium of our project, so just like you, CISFLEX, we are EU funded project under the program HT2020, sorry, uh, with a 27 million euros budget, 33 partners from nine countries, uh, which are mainly transmission system operators, academics, and also industrials partners. Um, the leaders of the different work packages are RT, Head Electrica, Terna, LS, the CE, and TU Berlin. Um, the project started in January 2018. And it will last until uh, <clears throat> April next year. So we, uh, we are entering our final year, basically. About the content of our project now. Um, so first, on one side, on the left part of uh, the slide, we have uh, simulations of long-term scenarios um, in order to identify future needs and sources of flexibility and also develop new tools and methods for flexibility assessment. So it's, we have two work packages dealing with that. On the right side of the, of the slides, uh, you can see that we have four large scale demonstrators where we want to foster the participation of new flexibility providers and demonstrate new flexibility services and also multi-services capabilities. And this, we have four demonstrators led by uh, transmission system operators. Um, and thus in between, we have the uh, work packages, which is more dealing with scaling up and replication of our, of our work. And so next slide, please. And so today you will have two presentations from Osmose. The first one uh, will be more related to the modeling uh, that we are doing related, related to the distributed flexibilities. And the second one uh, will be uh, on, a, on a demonstrator that we have on a, on a flexibility uh, scheduler. So enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nathalie. That was very quick. So you recovered already the time <laughs> that you were a bit in delay. So thanks for that. So let's continue now with the real content of this uh, webinar. And the first presentation will be given by Judita Pisano from the Osmosa project about the value of distributed flexibilities and how Osmosa tackled this at the level of modeling and market simulations. So Judita, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Alana. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alana, for the floor. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Giuditta Pisano. I'm uh, with the University of Cagliari in Italy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, and my research group works with the NCL Consortium at the Desmos project. In uh, uh, the work package too, we develop the procedure for modeling the flexibility uh, of uh, uh, distribution system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, such flexibility may arise uh, uh, at the, the TSO, DSO interfaces uh, from uh, distributed energy resources, uh, um, DRs, connected to the medium and low voltage level networks. Among the many uh, definition of flexibility, I like these ones. Uh, it's the same uh, cited by uh, Natalie. Um, from DR's point of view, flexibility is the ability of to be easily modified, but uh, from the power system point of view is the, the ability to manage in such changes. Uh, the flexibility is mainly found at the distribution level, but uh, the same products are needed for operating both the transmission and distribution uh, system. Next slide, please. Uh, I, uh, in this slide, I uh, only mentioned a few other points, and then main ones, I think, uh, necessary to be considered for the proper exploitation uh, of the DR flexibility. Recently, regulatory bodies uh, suggested many proposals and took action for enabling a new market players uh, uh, as uh, DRs. Um, 
to provide both uh, system and local services. However, currently there are still barriers that might uh, limit their effective involvement. New market schemes for opening the participation uh, uh, of uh, the arts in the service markets uh, have also been proposed, but uh, uh, there is not a proper standardization yet. These uh, uh, projects uh, uh, may uh, answer to uh, this lack. Uh, furthermore, the grid modification uh, in the role of the DSO and indeed the interaction between the system operators must be regulated and coordinated. Some solutions have been proposed around the European countries and in the world, but there are still open challenges. One um, of the main uh, issues, uh, I think, uh, is that uh, there are local needs for flexibility pro products at the distribution level. In this context, uh, it should be defined if their flexibility could be reserved only uh, to the TSO for system and not local services, or alternatively, um, it could be used uh, only locally by the DSOs. Uh, the flexibility is, is not uh, a new concept in power system. Uh, the TSO will contain, in this case, to resort to the usual providers of uh, flexibility, for instance, uh, the hydro plants. Uh, between this option, there is an intermediate one that shares the DR flexibility among the system operators. This is more uh, the uh, it, this is the more attractive option, I think, but uh, it, it needs fair and clear use cases for increasing the confidence in the proper implementation and in the effective use of flexibility from the, um, the demos of the Osmos and the UCIS Flex projects are in this direction. Let me cite only uh, um, a sample of uh, a study conducted for the most uh, important Italian, uh, with the most important Italian DSO external to the Osmos project project dedicated to the LV distribution system, we found that some flexibility should be locally used and only the residual can be offered to the upper voltage level grid. Next slide, please. Um, our objective within Osmos uh, is the, to assess the flexibility product potential offered by the DRs connected to a group of selected distribution networks in Italy and France, and they achieve the results are the aggregate bits in terms of quantity pairs, uh, price pairs offered by each selected distribution networks. Next slide, please. Um, the, um, our procedure consists of two main tasks. Uh, we firstly estimate the load and generation profile at the TSO DSO interfaces, uh, starting from electrical, socioeconomic, and territorial data. The procedure performs a special classification that aims at the subdividing the territory into gradually smaller portion for assigning to each territorial portion a share of demand and production of the selected region. Uh, the results are the active and the reactive power our profiles exchange to the TSO DSO interfaces with the transmission network. Next slide, please. Um, but then uh, we uh, start uh, from the assumption that uh, many distribution networks now are close to their, their roasting capacity and cannot tolerate any change in the set point of the hours connected to, the, to their grids. And thus we develop a methodology that is able of building synthetic network model for each real distribution network that we want to study. In this slide, uh, uh, on the left is picturally represented uh, such methodology. Uh, it combines elementary portion of a representative network according to the territorial information derived by the GDRS tools. This is uh, useful for all stakeholders defined by the DSOs that cannot know the grid details, but uh, um, permit this, uh, uh, this synthesis. Uh, th this uh, procedure uh, can be useful also for the DSOs even did they know their own networks, obviously, uh, if, they, if they would like to perform uh, studies on models of their networks able to give results with the, uh, which are easily generalizable or for massive application. At the, end, at the end of this task, uh, each real TSO, DSO interface is modeled by the active and reactive power profiles and also by uh, the network in terms of topology conductor 
etc. In the slide, an example of my uh, uh, area in uh, of my island in uh, um, Sardinia. Next slide, please. Uh, the second task is devoted to of assessing the value of the flexibility, the flexibility capabilities of each distribution network in terms of quantity and price pairs for each uh, time interval by considering the expected TSO, uh, DSO set point. Uh, uh, we calculate the maximum bids potential offered by the DR, uh, both in upward and downward. And uh, then uh, OP, optimal powerful calculation are performed perform subject to the technical constraints. Uh, it may happen that no viol violations are found and thus the feasible flexibility is the same as the potential. Otherwise, uh, the violation can be solved by resorting to the reactive power support or in the more critical uh, conditions, uh, the feasible flexibility is definitely reduced compared with the potential. In the final results are the price uh, qu quantity curves uh, of every single interval considered, as in this slide where the gray zones uh, highlight the blocked potential. Next slide, please. Uh, so I will describe a sample of the achieved results uh, for a French use case. Next slide, please. Uh, the perimeter of uh, this study is a small region of the central France that includes more than 250 distribution networks. Next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, uh, an example of the estimated power profiles uh, uh, at a few of the study TSO DSO interfaces. We used uh, the renewables forecasting uh, in 2030 that are uh, derived by, by other tasks of the OSMOS project. Many distribution network experience uh, a reverse flow toward the transmission system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, uh, uh, I show an example of the synthetic network model bit by composing feeders uh, uh, of uh, typical ambits uh, according to the data derived um, by the GIS tools. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, in this slide, the, the flexibility profiles during one of the typical day, um, days considered uh, of the um, entire wall uh, and of three um, distribution network. In green, the feasible flexibility that can be offered without any harmful impact on the distribution system operation. In red, the unfeasible uh, quantity due to its impact on the grid limitation and in orange the quantity that need uh, needs reactive power support to become feasible. I would like to stress only that the special downscaling reveals the local crit criticalities. By concluding the next slide, uh, only a few uh, remarks. Uh, flexibility products may compete with traditional uh, option for network expansion. Grid limitation cannot be disregarded. And uh, as uh, uh, it is uh, uh, previously mentioned, the TSO, uh, DSO, DSO uh, needs uh, uh, coordination. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Judita. That was a uh, very interesting. Uh, I would once more ask the uh, audience, in case you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A and we might take them also uh, for the round table. Uh, I see that there is one uh, question, so we have time for that, uh, Judita. So the question is the following. Are um, synchronicity constraints considered when modeling synthetic networks? Or is this type of modeling focused only on active and reactive power. Thank you for uh, your question. Um, in our model, we consider only uh, active and reactive power um, because uh, the objective of uh, our model is uh, to consider the uh, feasible uh, variation on uh, uh, the set point of the ER. So we uh, can consider the flexibility as uh, um, essentially uh, su substantial uh, fundamentally uh, the variation of the set point uh, of the um, of the dr okay 
thank you very much, uh, Judita, for the answer. Um, I propose that we continue with the next uh, presentation and that in case that there might be additional questions for uh, Judita or based on this presentation, that uh, people can still put them in uh, the Q&A and we might take them for the round table. So um, for the next presentation, uh, that's something that I will present myself. So maybe just briefly. So as you already know, my name is Elena Vera. I'm working also as a senior researcher within Energyville Pito, where I'm responsible for the activities on, on market design. And within the EU Sitzflex project, I was responsible for the work package on market design. And in that context, I would like to present you a couple of challenges that we encountered related to CSO DSO coordination and some of the ideas that we generated within the project to solve these problems. Next slide, please. So the challenge of TSO-DSO coordination, first of all, an important statement is that TSO-DSO coordination can be organized in a lot of different ways, but it will also highly depend on the way how you organize your market and the design of your markets could be something centralized, decentralized, or even distributed and peer-to-peer. -peer. And there were three main challenges that we addressed. First one was how should you actually integrate grid constraints in those different market design concepts. Second challenge was how can we organize a more combined approach for products uh, or for even market design in case we have multiple system services that we would like to combine. And the third challenge was how can we facilitate the participation of flexibility service providers independent of this chosen setup of markets and PSO DSO coordination. Next slide, please. So first challenge, grid constraints. First element is you can uh, include grid constraints before the process of procurement. So then it's part of the pre-qualification process or you can do it during procurement. When you do it before, it's typically, I would say a static system pre-qualification where you just verify if the provision of flexibility from a specific location is not violating grid constraints. This is how it's done today but it might become insufficient for the future. Therefore, we looked at options, how to include grid constraints in the procurement phase. And there, the main element, element is not anymore when do you need to uh, include grid constraints, but more how do you do that? And in particular, what type of grid information is necessary or feasible to include in your market optimization? And there you see we have uh, developed three options within ESS Flex, options where all grid information is included in the market optimization, options where we only do partial grid data, but then there might be the need for some iteration to check whether it was sufficient, or the third option where you actually would do a market clearing without any grid information. And then post um, clearing, there is a kind of check done by the system operators. You see different options, they all have their advantages and disadvantages in terms of complexity, but also in terms of correctness. And it's clear that the option that you will select will heavily determine the role of the system operators in the process, but also the possibility to include third parties. Next slide. The second challenge was related to the organization of a combined approach for multiple system services. And the detailed question was, can we actually do something jointly for the procurement process of balancing and congestion management? Answer was yes. Precondition is that we need to have a joint product, meaning that specifications for the product for balancing congestion management should be similar or ideally even the same. If you then have a joint product, you can allow uh, flexibility service providers to just bid only once, but you can take it one step further and not only have common products, but even also look for a common process for optimization and procurement of flexibility by TSOs and DSOs. And there you see on the right that we have looked into many options or developed many options that are possible because joint procurement is not just one concept. There are many, many options going from something relatively loose where you just coordinate the process in terms of timing to something very, very connected where even the optimization of the needs of a TSO and a DSO are jointly done, including procurement, but also activation and settlement. So um, you see an, an entire chain of integration possible, 
And that's also something that we discussed within ESC specs. Next slide. And then the third challenge was related to uh, ideas to facilitate participation of FSPs. And there we developed a concept, we call it the supermarket concept. This is quite novel because here what we do, we abandon completely the idea of products for system services. In this case, flexibility service providers just provide specifications of a pool of flexibility and system operators, they will just shop like in a supermarket on a daily basis to match the actual system needs with the provided offers. Of course, you see immediately the advantage. It's on the side of the flexibility service provider because they can just, I would say, explain how their portfolio looks like without uh, looking into different fragmented markets. There's obviously also a big attention point. This increases the level of complexity uh, at the level of, or at the side of the system operator, meaning that there will be a heavy need for advanced analytical tools for decision-making. But that's possible. And that's also something that we address within ESS Flex. Next slide. So that brings me to a couple of conclusions. So TSO, DSO coordination, we should not limit that to the decision on the model for TSO, DSO coordination. It's really not a one-dimensional problem. There are a lot of uh, layers. First of all, it impacts both the planning phase and the operation phase. Next, you see that there is a vertical coordination necessary between DSOs, but there's also horizontal coordination necessary from the highest transmission level up to the lowest granular flexibility asset. Then you also see that when you talk about TSO-DSO coordination for system services, it has a uh, connection with the product design of the system services, but obviously also the design of the flexibility mechanism. And these flexibility mechanisms, that's even not limited to flexibility markets, but you also should talk about tariffs or connection agreements. And to make it even more complex, when we talk about the market aspect, TSO, DSO coordination, you can have it at the level of pre-qualification, procurement, activation, and settlement. And then if we then even look at it from a higher perspective, it's not just limited to um, tools or processes. No, it's really about the fundamental role of system operators, their responsibilities, and the information they want to share with each other and with the outside world. So conclusion is that there needs to be innovation at many levels in order to really solve the problem of, or the challenge of PSO, DSO coordination. And I think that in the next presentations, a lot of interesting innovations and solutions will be presented. So thank you very much. And here I can close uh, this presentation and we can, uh, I don't know if there are questions. So there are no questions on the Q&R, uh, but maybe you can ask them at the end when we have the round table. Um, so if there are no questions, I'm just waiting a second. Otherwise we will move to the uh, topic two, uh, the presentation of the demonstrations, and the first one to be presented will be the Portuguese Flex Hub demonstration by Suzette Albuquerque from IREDES. Suzette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to all of the uh, attendees and participants in this uh, common and joint webinar, EUSH uh, Flex and OSMOS. Thank you for the, the invitation to talk about briefly about what we have done in our demonstrations. So the, what I'm going to show in the next slide is, uh, and it's already said, imagine this world with more than 50% of, of the electricity demand be met by renewable energy. And uh, uh, the statement that, uh, from the Commission that it's not uh, that's not something to think about. It's a goal, and it's a goal to be uh, obtainable at uh, 250. So this requires a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, planning, a lot of collaboration between DSOs and TSOs. Um, think about uh, the resilience of our systems in a cost-effective way, what, what the system wants, the electric system wants, at, at, at the end, everything is cost-effective and the lights are on for, for everybody because it's a commodity. So uh, what, what we, we, I will try to say in the, in, the, in the next slide 
is that um, what we had uh, it's uh, and it, it's uh, very simple. What uh, what is it's uh, the main um, the main focus and what we've done at with Flex Hub and what uh, with the difference uh, that you Flex in the Portuguese demo uh, brought is um, a coordination uh, uh, more coordination and the support uh, in the DSO side to the TSO needs regarding P, Q, and, and uh, the grid models. And that's taking in, in, uh, in consideration the distributed sites and the flexibility that exists at local level um, with its intermancy, with its needs for frequency regulations and voltage control and balancing reserves. Um, in an oppose what we can state it, that we have previously, that it was a more uh, di uh, discrete communication and more planning and uh, giving to the, um, the, the historical data. And uh, moving forward, um, what, uh, what, what we, exactly we've done and uh, in, the, in, the, in the demonstration side, what, uh, what you try to achieve that we, we have all these uh, local resources and the key, and uh, it's, a, it's a buzzword, but also it, it's a very, it's a key, it's to use the distribution level that in great amount are on the DSO level and uh, try to support the TSO uh, with some needs at the interconnection point. So uh, basically we, uh, we all of the partners, partners that participated in the um, in the particular in all your flex and in particular the the, um, the Portuguese demonstration and in the flex hub, what we try to to map in a, in a PQ maps was the limits from the DSO in order for the TSO to know our limits, what we could provide at an interconnection point, and then. Uh, uh, if the a systemic need from the TSO part uh, is enhanced, what what the, uh, the the almost real time the TSO informs us and we respond, taking into account uh, um, uh, some uh, tools that were developed that were developed also in the project, and we respond by activating the some distributions uh, that we have connected to that interconnection point and satisfies the TSO needs. Um, uh, this is not uh, just a simulation. That's why I have uh, also, you can see this uh, is opera operation uh, and uh, because we do it also uh, by acting directly in our SCADA. Of course, we, we took into consideration several variables and very important security of supply as always, and keep the grid safe, keep uh, no disturbance in both uh, DSOs grids and also management grids and also the, the TSOs. And it's a very important and very important cost effective way. Um, so, um, also, uh, an important thing that uh, we've done uh, at the same time, it was a dynamic model computation, with, uh, which, uh, and very simply, is, um, a, a, is a, a, it's a simulation that, and a tool for the DSO side that, um, uh, that the DSO can update a yearly or, or, uh, or two, two yearly or, or whenever just to take in consideration what it is on the, um, what are the variables or, or intermittent and res distribution resource is connected to DSOs. And this is very important because when the TSOs ask for a specific needs, we can determine which assets are more cost effective and more applied to satisfy the TSO needs. 
So moving on uh, to uh, the next slide, what uh, what we, we try to achieve in this in this um, in this uh, in, with this project, and I've seen this, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, I have to say it was in an in an agreed uh, uh, presentation, and it, it can show the uh, a long it's a roadmap what uh, so far DSOs and TSOs uh, uh, are required. To uh, and uh, and have done uh, all the hard work they have done to coordinate these efforts to determine which data, because essentially, and I um, and in our demonstration, we uh, we take into account the 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 the, the necessary data that we must pass. You, we know that we are subject, uh, all of us are subject to, to confidentiality. So what we are passing is, is something that we can say GDPR types that is anonymized because it's an aggregated value that I, I, I make available to the TSO at that inter, interconnection point. So it's a long run. We need uh, to uh, coordinate uh, more our efforts. And of course, we we have done it, and we have done also in other projects that are ongoing. But uh, it was, in fact, was very important because it's a, an important piece of this puzzle to to determine the, the variables. How can we achieve this? How can we um, have all uh, this distribution and, uh, and control uh, and intermediate loads? On the mostly on the DSO side, and how can we help to maintain the stability of the system, and pass them, and satisfy satisfies TSO needs? And well, it's uh, thank you, and uh, that is all for my side. Thank you very much, Suzette. Very very interesting, very challenging demo, I think, and there will be room for. Uh, discussion later on the round table. There is already, however, one specific question for you now. The question is the following. Does this demonstration includes the power sources like wind power and energy storage systems in hybrid operation using the supervision, which is controlled by Eredes, or are there other power sources associated at the DSO level? Um, thank you. Uh, we use the um, some um, we, we, we like it was in, a, in my slide. We, you, we, we in fact use uh, wind power systems and also battery systems uh, that were that uh, were connected to our grid, uh, and that's why we simulation uh, we simulated uh, all the, the the plans to see and and make it available cost efficient efficiently. What in the in a particular uh, interconnection point? What we could provide to the TSO? Yes, uh, the answer yes, yes. We you use the power power wind uh, power wind power and also storage. Okay, thank you very much, Suzette, for your answer. If there are no more additional questions, I would like to move on to the next presentation. We're not going so far because we stay in uh, Portugal. We uh, now present the Portuguese demo from the Osmoser project, where we have uh, two speakers, Rui Pestana from Ren and Ricardo Pastor from ID Investor. So the floor is yours. OK, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I will present the Portuguese demo from the, from the Osmos project uh, related to the TSO and DSO. Uh, it was uh, the re related to the flexibility, and I will share my presentation with Ricardo Pastor from R&D Nesta, uh, also from, from Portugal. Next slide, please. Okay, so the topics that I, I will address here is, uh, it's uh, of course, you know the answer already. Is there a need for a joint optimization of the TSO to and DSO interface? Okay, so I will focus more on the, on the interface point of view where we, we interconnect both transmission and distribution grids. And then I will explain what is the flexible scheduler that was developed by FASEC, one of the partners from the Osmos project and working with us on, on the task 7.2 of Osmos. And then I will also tackle the 
reactive um, power versus active power, okay? Because there, there is uh, the flexibilities. Sometimes you can split the flexibilities related to active power or to the reactive power. This will be the topics of the slides that I have prepared. Okay, so regarding the, the need for, for the joint optimization, of course, the answer is yes. Okay, basically, uh, I could say since it's not done yet, I mean, this is a, a, a little bit provocative. Of course, we optimize uh, at the planning level uh, with the assets of transmission and distribution. But of course, this answer uh, uh, is related to the operational point of view. Okay, as, as we see, sometimes the DSO needs to request the DSO to delay sometimes the switching off and off, uh, on and off of the shunt capacity as a medium voltage to improve voltage quality, normally at, um, at, the, <clears throat> at the eight o'clock in the, in the morning, uh, when, when we have the, the load and the disconnection of, of public lightning, the, uh, the lights in the, in, the, in the streets and everything, okay? The other thing is that by optimizing the voltage profile, uh, both in the transmission and the distribution grid, we can reduce, of course, the, the active losses, okay? And uh, by implementing uh, the closed loop, loop meshed uh, between um, uh, transmission, uh, transmission uh, substations, we can reduce the power at risk. I mean, this is the lack of the N-1 uh, security criteria of the radial uh, DSO grid, okay? Uh, of course, this topic specifically was not addressed in, in the flexible scheduler, that we are using here, but I was mentioned that this is the opportunities that we can have by uh, joint optimization between the TSO and the DSO. However, uh, as you know, uh, merging the, the, the grids and to make a global optimization is not really very easy. Uh, it's really a big challenging, the starting with the, the, the data and the, the format data, of course, and so we as, as evolved to the same um, the model, but uh, not all the, the DSOs in Europe uh, follow follow that that uh, step, and so sometimes it's not really easy to merge both both networks. And you see uh, efforts on the other project to go into a synthetic data and something like that. Okay, and and by the way, in some parts of the DAN network, there may be no flexibility synergies between the transmission and the distribution. This depends on the embed generation that is uh, on the distribution grid. Of course, sometimes you have regions of the country where, where you have hydro, others you have wind, the others you have solar, but uh, some, some of the grids, they may, may be uh, none of them, okay? The other thing is that uh, by merging, I mean, the, the, the meshed grids um, between the, the, the transmission and this distribution, may also uh, have a risk uh, aspect because um, by, by you can have a contingency on the DSO grid that may overload the distribution grid if you are using a meshed grid. So, uh, of course, there are opportunities, but there, there are also risks associated to this. So this means that this really needs to be uh, very well investigated, simulated, and, and uh, all the scenarios. Uh, next slide. So regarding the flexible scheduler, um, um, the way that we implemented was more focused on, on the, um, on the re, uh, reactive control and, and, and the voltage profile that allows the minimization of the active power losses. Okay, so in reality, it is an optimization tool to minimize the DSO grid loss. Uh, since this software uh, is, only, is only looking for the DSO grid uh, in, in detail, but taking, of course, the, the, the interface of the TSO. But uh, for the reactive uh, point of view, uh, we are, we are uh, setting, I mean, uh, trying to optimize the best uh, flexible assets, which have assets from the DSO and, and from the TSO and then also from the DSO. So this is the, the one case in, in Portugal where we have the very high voltage at 220 kV. Uh, um, and, and then you have the 60 kV where, where we give the, the, the power to the distribution. This is just a, a small section. As you can see, uh, you have the tap positions of the, of the, <clears throat> of the, uh, of the transformers uh, from the TSO. You have also the, the shunt capacitors of the, of, the, of the TSO. 
But then uh, regarding the DSO grid, you have the, also the tap positions of the high voltage, medium voltage, uh, also the shunt capacities on the, on the medium voltage in, in, in this region uh, that we simulated is on the 15 uh, kV grid. And also um, because of the embed generation, uh, we can also uh, have some uh, way to control uh, the reactive power contribution from the dispersed uh, generation. Okay, Th this software, of course, will take consideration the constraints of the grid related to voltage and uh, nodal li limits, okay, uh, the, and also the generation limits and also the branch limits, okay. Uh, and it uh, will simulate for 24 hours. So it's really a multi-period optimization period. So it's not just looking for the next hour, it's looking for the, uh, 20, the next 24 hours. Uh, so it's a multi-period. And also uh, they aggregate the object function which is the grid losses uh, with, with, uh, with the restrictions uh, by using penalty, penalty factors, okay? This is a really a smart way to do it because they, they, they transform the, the art constraints in soft constraints, and this allows the, the flexible uh, scheduler uh, to optimize in tool to get a, a feasible solution, uh, because it, it will become, the, the limits will be uh, soft limits, and so it's much easier to have uh, um, uh, a solution. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, this was just pointing the, the, the DSOs. So regarding the, the active and the, the reactive, uh, of course, um, why, why we target uh, mainly the reactive power? Because it, it's a daily issue, okay? We have lower voltage during peak hours and higher voltage during off-peak hours. So this is really a challenge every day uh, if you are a, a, a transmission or, or distribution system operator. This is really a, a daily, uh, daily business for us. Of course, um, as a direct impact in minimizing losses, because if you have higher voltage, you have less current and then you minimize the losses. And, but if you have lower loss, lower voltage, in reality, you are increasing the losses, okay? And this, of course, the voltage profile has impact on power quality, uh, because sometimes um, in, 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 in rural areas, if the voltage is very low, uh, some time of equipment cannot work. Okay, it depends, of course, on the type of grids. Regarding uh, frequency and active control, um, of course, this first statement is, is, is a provocation. Uh, when I say frequency is not a DSO concern, of course, the, 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 they take this in, in consideration. But as you know, uh, typically um, all the continental Europe uh, are controlling uh, the, the frequency and, and the and mainly is the, the, the main generators connected to the transmission is looking to the, to the frequency control. But anyway, uh, um, <clears throat> it, it has a low priority for, for, the, for the DSO. Regarding uh, congestion, okay, we could say congestion can be uh, e, uh, because of active power issues. This can be because of excess load and then you overload the transformers or you have excess generation and then you overload the, the, the distribution grid or, or the transmission grid related to the inverse power that coming from the distribution grid. But uh, in reality, these limits are on MVA. This means also that the reactive power can, can help solving some issues. If the overload is, is, is a minor uh, topic, I mean, uh, less than 5% or something like that, okay? Of course, congestion may occur only at, at peak time or at a short time uh, because these in contracts with the voltage that I mentioned that is uh, typically uh, during the 24 hours of the day, during the night and during the day. Normally congestions only takes uh, during, during peak time. Um, of course, long-term planning um, should identify and, and they identify uh, and solve these issues. Uh, will will the, the, that idea to build and forget, okay? So they do the reinforcements and then they, they, they hope that this is solved forever. Of course, this is not completely true nowadays because you have the fast installation of solar PV and, and on the rooftop and everything and also uh, small, small PV plants uh, that are popping up everywhere. And, and these are faster than the planning stage that is, that is going on. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, this I will pass to Ricardo, please. Okay, thank you, Rui. So uh, at that stage, uh, the R&D Nestev is the partner responsible for the, uh, the demonstration in the lab of the FES of the flexibility scheduler in our real-time power system laboratory. So let's first talk a little bit about the, the process, so how these will be performed. So this is a day ahead process, okay? So we are talking about the, the scheduling for the next 24 hours of the optimization of reactive power in the distribution and the uh, observability area of the TSO side. So the first step, in just to clarify, in these, uh, in these uh, demonstrations, so uh, our Nester will play a little bit the role of the, of the TSO in the, in the lab. So uh, the first step would be to provide some operational planning data and the TSO forecasts to the, to the simulator, so to, to, the, to perform the operational planning at the TSO level. This information will also be shared with, uh, with the distribution side, in this case, the, the, the flexibility scheduler that is represented uh, uh, basically with the TSO observability area planning data and the TSO observability area forecast as well. So after this first step of operational planning, the initial voltage conditions uh, at the TSO DSO interface are provided to the flexibility scheduler and the, the tool will perform the, the, the calculations for the optimal power flow and the load data that they already have for the distribution side. And it will provide the optimal operational schedule, not only for the distribution network, but also with some suggestions at the TSO observability area. Uh, and it will update as well the TSO, DSO interface power flows. So these are uh, in fact uh, uh, affected by any actions that are taken at the distribution side. And uh, as as a as a last uh, part of the of the demonstration, so the uh, we will update the the our model in the Opal simulator with the TSO DSO power flows, the new ones, and we will run simulations to to considering these optimal operational schedule, and uh, basically we will collect the results and validate uh, the impact of these uh, of these uh, schedule. We can move to the next one, please. So just to give you some uh, visibility on, on the models and what we are doing. So on the, on the right side, you have the, the model that we have in the model in the, in the PS, in the, sorry, in the Opal system. So in Hypersim, in which we have two substations with the connection to the distribution side. It's, it's the ones that are inside the uh, blue square or the blue box, blue dash box. And uh, these two substations, they are linked through a, through a representative distribution network, okay, which is considered. And they have uh, uh, also some uh, renewable energy resources uh, at the distribution side, which will be optimized by the flexibility scheduler, including some wind, farm, wind power plant, solar power plant, and the hydro power plant. Uh, in terms of the... Um, of the detailed model. So the, the detailed model of the distribution network, it's only uh, defined in the flexibility schedule. What we have is at the transmission side, what we have is, the, is, is some information on the TSO, DSO observability area, common, uh, common observability area. And the flexibility schedule also has this information about some assets that uh, 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 flexibility assets that are available at the transmission side, as uh, for example the the capacitor banks that uh, exist in the in, in the two substations. Uh, this uh, network on the distribution side it's a representative one, and it's only uh, defined in the flexibility schedule. So these after after we have this uh, information, the data is exchanged within. The, the Opal system and the flexibility schedule. And we can validate the, the results as well by, by retrieving this information from the FES to the, to the Hyperseam and doing the, all the simulations and validate if the, if the, um, if the limits are kept within the, the defined uh, range. I think we can move. Thank you, Rui. Uh, just to, to wrap up, so the, 
The flat fuel scatter enables the joint optimization of the TSO and the uh, TSO and DSO interface on the 60 kV level. Um, this software is a really a multi period optimization and, and allows a secure operation planning for the next 24 hours. And of course, uh, uh, this optimization, uh, the goal is to, to reduce the, the grid losses. Okay. So the next step, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the next step is to really to, to complete the, the, the simulations that has been done by R and Nester uh, jointly with, with, uh, with, with FASEC, which is providing some, some updates on the software anyway. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the, the finished data liberal 7.4 7 with, with the results that, to, that we have from our demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting again. So we actually have uh, maybe time for one quick question. Um, so Rui Ricardo, the following question was put, uh, do you rerun the dispatch in real time? Yeah, I, 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 I can answer that. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, we, we do not do the, the, uh, the real time redispatch. Uh, so uh, what is done is that we we have an initial uh, set point for the for the voltages that is provided, and uh, and um, basically after the the results are taken from the flexibility scheduler uh, for the next twenty four hours, we will validate those results. So it's it's performed in a, in real time, but. Uh, uh, yeah, basically, it's not performing real time yet. <laughs> it was actually, uh, I would say, a triple question because there were two additional parts on it. So uh, uh, it was also uh, requested: um, how long does it take the simulation, and how many hours or minutes before uh, you do it? Yeah, it's it's really quick. So uh, in in terms of the flexibility scheduler the the running on the flexibility schedule is is really fast so it it will take like a couple of minutes to perform uh regarding the opal uh, simulation we we take a few minutes of simulation and we just validate the the final results so it's it's not in fact a real time uh simulation in the sense that we will not run 24 hours uh straight uh, we will perform some uh, couple of minute simulation for each of the of the hours, so we can validate the results of the of the of the flexibility scheduler. Yes. Okay, that was clear. Thanks for the detailed answer. So I think with that we can uh, close our Portuguese session of this uh, workshop. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Rui. And we can uh, move to Italy to uh, one of the ESISFLEX uh, demos, the Italian demo, where Simone Tegas from e Distribuzione will give us some insights on their demo. So, Simone, the floor is yours. Thanks, Selena, for the floor. And good morning, all. I'm Simone Tegas from e Distribuzione. Um, I work as project management officer within the founded projects unit uh, of the network development function. And uh, here, uh, as a representative of uh, E-Distribuzione, the main Italian DSO, mm, we uh, um, are here to present as demo leader of the Italian uh, demonstrator, the uh, research we made in the EOSIS-less project uh, within uh, uh, the work package six uh, to, uh, in order to demonstrate uh, how it is possible to use uh, flexibilities connected uh, to the medium voltage grid for congestion management uh, and uh, voltage control. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have worked and we are still working uh, in the research and development activities with uh, uh, RSA the Italian Center for the Development of Research Activities in the Electroenergy uh, Sector, and the Global Infrastructure and Network uh, as a linked third party of uh, a distribution. Uh, in our demonstrator, uh, we 
are exploring uh, the devolution and how it's possible to evolve our distribution network infrastructure by integrating monitoring systems uh, with advanced smart grid devices uh, in order to encourage the ancillary service provision, uh, taking into account, uh, obviously, both the TSO and DSO needs uh, and constraints. And uh, we are doing it, uh, realizing a demonstrator uh, in the real distribution network, in a portion of the real distribution network, uh, we operate uh, in the north of Italy, in the area of Forlì Cesena, which is a particular area of uh, our uh, grid, uh, but uh, we have the same situation also in many other parts of our country. This area is characterized by a strong penetration of renewable and uh, generation, mainly photovoltaic. And um, at the same time, we see low consumption in uh, comparison with the generated energy. So uh, we can uh, often uh, see backfeeding phenomena from the medium voltage to the high voltage. And uh, we choose this area in order to uh, try to manage uh, all the uh, distributed uh, resources uh, connected uh, to this network uh, uh, to uh, reach the uh, project goals in order to acquire the project goals. Uh, as I told before, uh, we are working on a, a real portion of the real network, uh, the network connected to a primary substation, uh, un quarto primary substation, uh, which consists uh, in uh, about 260 secondary substation. We also consider in our demonstrator all the eight medium voltage feeders connected to it. And this network is characterized by an installed their capacity of 39.8 megawatt peak with an average energy produced per year of about uh, 46 gigawatt hours per year. Uh, in order to demonstrate uh, that uh, it is possible to provide uh, ancillary services to the TSO, exploiting the uh, resources connected uh, to the distribution network. We use in our demonstrator, uh, uh, no, back please. Okay, uh, we use uh, uh, in our demonstrator uh, uh, the uh, resources owned by the, the DSO, for example, the unload tap changer for both the transformers in the primary substation, which are remotely controlled, an electric storage system also owned by the uh, distributor, and uh, uh, four uh, PV generators, which are owned by private owners. And uh, in order to uh, control them, uh, we needed to sign voluntary agreements uh, uh, between uh, the distributor and the owner of these plants. Uh, because uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the distributor in Italy cannot uh, directly manage these plants uh, without an agreement with uh, the owner of them. And last but not least, the, uh, the installation for the first time ever for a distribution of two static compensator, one module per bus bar in the primary substation in order to, uh, to, to, to support uh, voltage and uh, um, provide uh, absorbing uh, uh, and reactive power uh, depending on the, the needs. Next slide, please. All uh, these uh, resources uh, are uh, used uh, to reach these main objectives uh, you can see in uh, these slides. Uh, first of all, uh, we intend to demonstrate that uh, uh, it is possible to include uh, renewable energy sources, uh, storage, uh, stack-ons, uh, and LTCs uh, in uh, congestion management uh, and voltage support, uh, uh, first of all. Uh, but also we can test the use of these uh, or some of these resources uh, uh, for uh, uh, balancing. 
but we have to say that uh, except uh, for the, in, the, the integration of RAS and the storage for congestion management and frequency balancing services, that has only been simulated in our project. All the available resources uh, are uh, effectively, effectively involved in uh, voltage regulation, which is just in the field, uh, interfacing uh, above all RAS and DSO devices uh, with the existing uh, infrastructure. We naturally uh, set uh, um, a new coordinated process uh, uh, for ancillary service provision to the TSO, a coordinated process uh, which uh, requires uh, an improvement of the observability of uh, what happens uh, in the distribution network uh, towards the, the TSO. And uh, uh, naturally, we, uh, as uh, uh, we needed we have uh, done uh, an improvement also uh, of the forecasting in general of production and load in, uh, in our network. How we have realized these main objectives and how we are still working to complete the realization, the achievement of the, the project uh, goals. In the next slide, uh, you, we can see uh, the main important uh, results uh, achieved. First of, all, first of all, we improved uh, the just existing network optimization tool, which is uh, the core of the network calculation algorithm system module integrated in the local uh, SCADA. Uh, we and uh, we had this improvement through the implementation of the reactive power cal capability calculation at the primary substation interface. Why we speak about uh, a local SCADA? Because uh, um, we have, uh, um, in, in this case, uh, two SCADA, two SCADA systems uh, interconnected. We have the central SCADA, which is manage uh, the uh, greatest uh, area, greatest part of our distribution network. And this central SCADA is interconnected with a local SCADA, which is located in the primary substation we are uh, using for the demonstrator. And it is able to manage uh, all the uh, the network uh, connected to that power uh, uh, primary substation. The local SCADA receives uh, all the information coming from the field thanks uh, uh, all, to all the field devices uh, installed uh, in the secondary substations, but also at the premises of the uh, power plants involved in the demonstrator and merging them with all the information about the uh, forecast, uh, it is able to, uh, to give in a very quickly uh, way uh, the um, reactive power uh, capability calculation at the interface between the TSO and DSO. Naturally, in order to uh, make uh, effective uh, to in order to apply uh, the, the regulation on uh, all the resources uh, involved, we needed to also make some improvements to our SCADA system uh, in, in implement, implementing the regulation functionalities for uh, voltage support and allow the DSO itself to send signals to the, the assets owned, owned and not owned by the, the DSO uh, for uh, reaching uh, the exact uh, the, 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 the results. Uh, naturally, considering that uh, the TSO is not a real partner of the Italian team, uh, demonstrator team, we uh, needed uh, to uh, develop an automated uh, coordination process uh, using uh, 
an ISC 100 for protocol simulator. We implemented a protocol simulator based on the same protocol used in the real interface between the uh, SCADAs of uh, E-Distribuzione and uh, Terna. And this uh, uh, emulator acts as a substitute uh, in the transmission of some specific signals and measurements between the DSO and TSO. In particular, once we uh, calculated uh, the um, um, exact range of reactive power capability uh, according to the availability of the resources uh, on our network, we send uh, this uh, range of capability to the emulated TSO. Uh, the emulated TSO can choose um, a specific value of set point that needs to be applied to the network in order to provide the service to the TSO itself. This value uh, is sent to our SCADA system and then our SCADA operates the disaggregation of this value to all the available flexibilities in order to reach the expected results. Naturally, in order to improve the coordination, in order to improve the um, observability and the quality of the results, we developed uh, the nowcast functionality, with, uh, which integrates the forecast of the distributed resource energy production with the network management and optimization tool. And uh, this is the last uh, action we need to complete for our demonstrator, uh, we are completing the installation of the static compensator on, the, on, on our network. At the moment, we have uh, posed and installed the secondary substation, which is necessary to connect the STATCOM to the DSO grid according to the Italian electrotechnical standards. But in the next and in the next weeks, uh, we need to complete the installation of the STATCOM itself. Last slide. What we want to uh, communicate with the results of our network. Uh, first of all, uh, that uh, it is uh, important uh, uh, to uh, see the DSO, the distribution network, uh, not only as a, a, a distribution uh, or as a, a network operator, but like a system operator, because it has to manage energy fluxes and analyze network constraints in order to provide services, uh, first of all, to the TSO. But to do it, we need to improve the TSO and DSO coordination and uh, naturally increase the res integration uh, uh, and the distribution network observability in order to provide a better service to the transmission system operator. We, we want to demonstrate, we are demonstrating that new assets like stackcoms, for example, in our case, can be tested in order to perform services like reactive power compensation and voltage support. And uh, last aspect, that is a consequence that could be a consequence of all the three previous points. Uh, a new concept of resilient grid is possible uh, in uh, scenarios in which uh, all the distributed energy resources uh, can be exploited also to guarantee the continuity of supply and quality of energy. So uh, use of these resources uh, when it is possible, not only to provide services, uh, auxiliary services to the TSO, but also to provide a always better quality of service uh, within the distribution network. So I uh, concluded my intervention. Thank you very much, Simone. See, there are no specific questions. In case there are, um, you can still put them in the Q&A and we can, we can take them during the round table. So we can move on to the final presentation of this webinar before we start our round table, which is the German demo 
also from the Sysflex project. And here, Mike will uh, present us some, uh, say, some interesting insights in what they did in their uh, demo. Mike, you're the latest, but um, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, okay, Mike Stout, my name uh, from Midnight Storm, uh, R&D coordinator and uh, project lead for the German demo in EU Sysflex. And now what we want to do in the German demo, as you can see in the map, is that's our grid. We are, Midnet is part of E.ON, of the E.ON group, and together with the Fraunhofer and the University of Kassel and Inestec in Porto, Portugal, we are developing the German demonstrator that wants to use assets like uh, wind power, uh, wind farms, uh, PV parks, um, also uh, biogas uh, power plants um, or other assets in the high voltage, in our high voltage grid to uh, um, facilitate at the end uh, flexibilities in active and reactive power for congestion man management, voltage control in our high voltage grid, but also make it available in the extra high voltage grid of the transmission system operator. Um, High voltage grid means 110 kV for us. So next slide, please. I, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, so some drivers, uh, I think you all know that uh, there are more and more renewables and um, with this renewables, the conventional sources of flexibilities will be reduced. And um, therefore, in total, we also make it um, at the end cost efficient, this whole um, operation of grids and therefore we need new measures for the grid operation. And uh, in our demonstration, we want to set up uh, a new coordination process to use these flexibilities between TSO and DSO. And of course, uh, wanted, had developed some tools, some algorithms uh, to make this happen. So, short, I think, next slide. And uh, what is the difference between the four before EU Sysflex German demonstration processes and what it's after? It's uh, at the end, the integration of renewables uh, into a process that was only widely used for in the planning phase for the TSOs and not so much for the DSOs. And um, due to the fact that uh, the renewables are mostly connected in the distribution grid, the DSO has to be uh, integrated in these uh, processes for congestion management and voltage control. And of course, it starts with uh, congestion management, but uh, if you do the congestion management without voltage control, you um, let you don't you can't use the full potential of flexibilities. So, and what we do, we um, op um, observe our grid, but not in real time in the operational planning phase. So we use forecasts to say, okay, 12 hours ahead, 24 hours ahead, up to 48 hours ahead. We know, we calculate, we predict the power flow in our grid, and then we see what uh, flexibilities we need. And um, then use flexibilities that are available and optimize it so that at the end, the result is also what is available to for the TSO. It's in the connection points between us and the TSO. And um, due to forecast deviations, you can't say 36 hours ahead, that's it. But uh, therefore, this uh, process uh, is an 
is an updated one and process uh, that goes also in interday uh, up to at the end uh, possibility how fast you can calculate we are at the moment calculating this our whole high voltage grid and optimizing it and um, stating what's available for the TSO in around five minutes so that means 15 minutes ahead you could use our tools um, but uh, as it is now the process ends uh, around uh, 30 minutes before real time so for active power next slide please and that's uh, what I told you, the process. We use all the input data we have, a topology, a schedules, forecasts, um, what you need to predict congestions, do it for our own grid, and then call, uh, so activate at the end, so call for flexibilities that they can be activated in real time, but that's uh, operational planning. Process. Um, next slide, please. Here you can see that we have underlying grids. So uh, in Germany, it's not only a cascade of TSO and DSO, but uh, it can be uh, TSO, DSO, first order, second order, third order in some areas. So that means uh, the underlying grid uh, has to do the same around the same process. And uh, we feed into our calculations the uh, availability of flexibilities in underlying grids and if the flexibilities in our grid are not um, enough then not sufficient then we also give the request to the underlying grid at the end to activate flexibilities in the air grid was what they beforehand stated that is available. So we make sure not to jeopardize with grid operation and other system operators. Next slide, please. And as mentioned before, that's the same with the TSO. We calculate what's available for the TSO. The TSO does its own redispatch, as the process is called. And at the end, to request the flexibility that we should activate in our grid or maybe in the underlying grid that is then also processed and if it's not sufficient what uh, we stated that's only in our grid but in the underlying grid it's the request is forwarded this part of the request to the underlying grid operator next slide please so and that for reactive power that was all uh, active power the congestion management process and uh, for reactive power we set up a similar process and uh, you if you there is an, an a band with where the voltage uh, can be where there is no um, coordination need between the different system operators but if the voltage uh, goes outside this band then there are measures needed and uh, these measures can be triggered within, within its own grid, but uh, again, if it's not uh, sufficient, the flexibilities that are available or this uh, leaf of this band is uh, triggered by external grid, then this same coordination scheme can be used. And of course, the uh, tools at the end for uh, this uh, action, active power management and reactive power management should be automated. Um, in the first slide, you have seen that we are, have more than 1,000 assets in our grid that can be used for these flexibilities and that's in the manual process and manual thing not feasible for the operator. So, and uh, for the DSO, these processes were only real-time processes. There were kind of similar coordination schemes in the past, but only for emergency measures. And we want to bring it in this operational planning phase with the results of uh, EOSYSFLEX with our demonstration. We have uh, shown that they are feasible, um, but 
it's need to be transported into reality at the end. Next slide, please. So here a short summary. Um, this is the uh, outcome, what we want to show uh, where we started and also some um, numbers, what flexibilities we want to, or flexibility resources we want to use in our demonstration. Mm. Next slide, please. So here is, uh, um, is it's uh, the data is uh, from this uh, field test and uh, also pre-field test data simulation. Um, so optimization, what wants this optimization do? We have two tools so on the left side, it's from the, it's a Fraunhofer tool and on the right side, the Inestec tool. And they are different kind of approaches. Um, the, the Fraunhofer tool is uh, its best feature is uh, that they can translate the request from the TSO in our case into the segregated set points for all the power plants and also to calculate this beforehand what is feasible to transmit and in flexibility to the overlaying grid. But the PQ maps tool is not an iterative um, approach between active and reactive power. It's a simultaneous calculation of e active and reactive power flexibilities. And in this PQ maps, you can actually see what set point active and reactive power component is feasible. So, and we, at the end, uh, what we want to do in the field test in the next two weeks is to compare the, these approaches in kind of how accurate they are. That's still open as one of the field tests. So, and the next slide, please. It's uh, here you can see um, we have an, a mesh grid and uh, you can't add up the flexibilities at every grid connection point to the whole grid area. Uh, it's more complicated and therefore we also need this uh, optimization. And next slide. So, yeah, that is an example what we, how we can support with our uh, tools the, the, the TSO. It's an, it's an event that happened in reality. We had to, in 2018, we had to curtail um, one gigawatt um, in, in total in our grid because there was a voltage drop in the uh, extra high voltage grid, in the transmission grid. There were some issues, uh, forecast deviation, and it added something up, but at the end, it was a voltage drop. And uh, to ease this, it uh, was necessary to uh, curtail one gigawatt of wind and PV. And with our tool, as you can see in the, in the black curve, um, we could have support it that uh, no voltage drop at the end would have been. The, the dotted and uh, lines um, that are, the broken lines are the, the bandwidth more flexibility and reactive power at one certain grid connection point. And this grid connection point, it was alone 500 megawatts of installed capacity of one gigawatt in feet that had to be curtailed. So, and uh, that are re the results that show exactly how the active role of a DSO can be in future and how to facilitate flexibilities from the distribution grid to the uh, transmission grid, but also in the distribution grid hmm. for, for grid operation. Yeah. So I think that was the last slide. Then it's okay. Yep. Thank you, Mike, um, for your presentation. 
there was a very short question, but I would ask you to answer that really, really quickly so we can move mm -hmm. to the round table. Yep. Uh, the question was, what is the level of penetration of RES in, the, uh, in your network? In our, because we are the distribution system operator, uh, we have a share of RES in consumption of over 100%. So over the year, and we have uh, over around 9.5 gigawatt installed renewables and a maximum uh, consumption of 3.2 gigawatt. So threefold of our load. It's quite, I would say it's quite massive. Yep. <laughs> we can conclude. Okay, thank you very much, Mike, for your interesting presentation. So that brings us now to the end of the presentations, but don't leave yet. And we move now to our round table where we um, also have an uh, additional guest in addition to the panelists. We also have uh, an additional guest from uh, Terma uh, who will also join, uh, Tommaso. Uh, I don't know if you are there. So I would ask all the um, panelists, but also Tommaso to uh, switch on their cameras so we can uh, answer some uh, questions and have a, a little bit of an uh, online debate. My, my camera is not working, so I'm sorry. You know that you're there. We will, uh, we will not forget you, Mike. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So maybe um, just as a warming up, uh, first, a uh, more practical oriented question, because we have all those uh, demo representatives in here. So tell us, uh, what was the most difficult thing in the implementation of your, of your demo? Because you have now presented all nice solutions that worked well, but uh, we all know that a demo process can be challenging. So can you tell us maybe what was for you, just very short, the most difficult thing and how did you solve it? So um, let's start with uh, Suzette. Well, with <laughs> security, uh, security issues um, in, in a good sense. Uh, the, that uh, we all face in the, this R&D project. Well, DSOs, uh, but we must understand, the, we are very security aware, so, um, and cybersecurity aware. So when we start in using this, uh, this kind of implementation, especially in R&D uh, projects, there's always uh, um, a stress for us to accomplish with, with timings, but of course, it's our responsibility to uh, be certain and to maintain the security of the grid, you know, the assets, you know, that, that there are people involved. So we went, we understand that, but <laughs> usually we stress with, uh, with the security to, to give a, a good uh, speed in, the, all, in all of the process in order to, to accomplish, his, uh, accomplish our goals uh, in the demos. And it's not uh, every time easy, but uh, we understand that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Suzette. Um, so, Rui, is that, was it the same for your demo, the, the security part, or did you encounter something else that you want to share with us? Yes, I mean, from our side, of course, uh, since this is a research project, it was the fact that FASEC was, had to develop the flexible uh, schedule tool, and there was delay in providing that software. But of course, the, the most uh, uh, problem that we have now is what Ricardo is fighting to, to integrate it on the real-time simulator and, uh, and do, uh, do a lot of scenarios and simulator. We can complement on that. Thanks. Yeah, the interface. The interface between uh, different platforms, simulation platforms, is, is key. <laughs> okay. It's really challenging. Oh, well, I would say good luck, <laughs> but I can understand. Yeah. Simone, can you, uh, do you see similarities with your challenges or you can add something on top of this? Uh, we faced with uh, two uh, kinds of challenges. Uh, the, the first one uh, is connected to the regulatory framework. Uh, and the second one is connect, was connected to the procurement of the statcom. Consider that uh, it, it is the first Stockholm we are connecting to our distribution network. Um, regarding the regulatory framework, uh, um, we needed to adapt some aspects of our demonstrator uh, because uh, uh, we uh, are not able to do in a complete way some uh, of the some actions 
uh, as I told uh, during the present, you know, all the uh, uh, services uh, connected to uh, um, active power uh, provision, uh, for example, uh, are uh, only simulated in, in our uh, uh, demonstrator. Uh, consider that we also needed to reach uh, the agreements with the owners of the power plant in order to manage them uh, in a remote way and so on. The other challenge is connected to the, the acquisition of the, the Stockholm. And uh, con the fact that it is the first Stockholm and uh, it is going to be connected and installed in the area of the primary substation. So we did uh, a complex uh, technical specification for this cause. Uh, the first call for tended uh, received uh, not compliant uh, uh, offers and not compliant proposals. So we needed to do another uh, call for, uh, European call for tenders. Uh, we, we lost uh, uh, some months uh, uh, during the, the project, but uh, after uh, some modifications, uh, uh, we reached uh, the results and now we are completing the installation of the start. Yeah, thank you very much, Simone. Mike, maybe very brief on your side for the specific demo challenges that you encountered. Uh, specific demo, it's a uh, kind of everything. Um, first, we had also some kinds of regulatory issues, but um, it was not our effort only, but the regulation in Germany changed. So we are fine in this point. And the other point was uh, not the cybersecurity aspect, but uh, because we are close to the grid control center. So cybersecurity is, uh, is the grid control center cybersecurity, but uh, to set up the data exchange we need within this uh, circumstances of cybersecurity. That was then the main challenge on a technical part besides developing the algorithms, but that's normal R&D stuff, I would say. But the data exchange was a hard topic, formats, understanding the data set. Yeah, no, um, very interesting. And uh, I would say, uh, yeah, that's why demo projects are always a challenge and not easy. Um, but what was interesting is that the two of you, both Simone and, and Mike, actually mentioned already the regulatory aspect as one of the barriers, even within a demo context. So I would like to move to a next point, which is what, according to you, should change in the regulatory framework, of course, to make your solution, and not only a demo solution, but also maybe replicable within your country and even uh, in a broader sense uh, in, in, in the entire Europe. And so that's maybe more for the demo participants, uh, but also connected to that, do you see other regulatory challenges uh, where you say, if we want to move beyond these solutions and go further, could be, uh, should be solved and addressed. And maybe I would like to give the floor to, uh, to Maso first. Um, so as a TSO, you might also have a view on what are for you regulatory bottlenecks uh, and what do you think is a priority to be solved in the, in the coming years? I don't know, Tommaso, if you, um, we, we cannot hear you. Okay, I think we lost Tommaso for a while. Then we continue with the, uh, with the others. We will see when Tommaso can uh, rejoin us. So um, maybe uh, because Simone, you already gave some, some hints on regulatory uh, challenge. He maybe ex well, give some more uh, I would say background, and then we can see whether that was the same for the other uh, demos. I, looking at the uh, Italian uh, situation, uh, consider that uh, um, at, at the moment, it's not possible to extend in a generalized way the involvement of uh, all the dispersed generator, renewable or not, with uh, the, the same approach we use uh, in the uh, LCS Flex demonstrator. Uh, since uh, 2017, uh, the regulatory framework allows the inclusion of a, a pilot regulation aimed at opening uh, the ancillary service market uh, 
managed by the TSO to new resources. But uh, at today, at the moment, uh, the regulation regarding TSO flexibility needs uh, has not yet been uh, defined. Uh, there's not, for example, a remuneration mechanism dedicated to the modulation of the reactive power aimed at meeting the DSO uh, distribution system operator needs. Um, naturally, uh, to uh, apply, uh, and as an Italian demonstrator, we are able to provide the services uh, to the TSO, uh, and uh, uh, we are ready for this uh, situation, but uh, according to regulatory framework, uh, we cannot uh, exploit the same resources uh, only also for uh, our uh, for our needs. Uh, look, speaking at the ESO. Uh, no, in addition, there is the fact that uh, uh, the, the the use the exploitation of uh, private resources uh, need. Uh, uh, um, voluntary agreements uh, to be signed between uh, TSO and the owner of uh, these plants, uh, uh, photovoltaic in the case of our demonstrator. And another important topic is the fact uh, that uh, uh, the regulatory framework uh, is not fully uh, defined uh, um, in, in order to manage uh, active power uh, related services, uh, as I told before, that could represent a good opportunity to increase the share of renewable energy sources in, in, this, uh, in this building, in this aspect. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Simone. That's uh, quite a lot that uh, needs to be changed. Uh, I don't know, Tommaso, do we have you uh, with us now? Could you maybe complement uh, some of the challenges on behalf of uh, Terna, what do you see at the regulatory side? Yeah, Simonas was uh, a pretty good recap. Um, what I might add on top of it is that, I mean, the national regulatory authority here was pretty clear. So the first step that we need to define, let's say, regulatory opening is to, let's say, set up projects to get DSOs and TSOs so that we can define the model. So uh the real challenge here is the first step uh, since we're starting pretty much from a greenfield is to assess what are the process steps that we need uh to put in place uh, in order to let's say procure assets that we don't see as tso's um of course and to let's say have some let's say priority mechanism that allow us allows us to let's say define what resource is used for what service and for what grid operator uh, as someone was stating uh, a few minutes uh, ago uh, during one of the presentations. So for us, that's pretty much the challenge. Uh, define understanding what's the model that can be scaled up at national level. Of course, there are many DSOs, uh, but the model, the coordination model has to be one for all of them. Yeah, thank you very much, Tomaso. Indeed, I think that scaling up on itself will uh, definitely a bit, uh, be a challenge. Um, maybe moving back to uh, to Portugal, uh, Suzette, I was wondering if the what Simone mentioned uh, related to a bit the the missing regulatory framework for, on the DSO side uh, for some specific elements. Is that also the case in in Portugal, or what do you see in Portugal as uh, of, from the DSO perspective as, as one of the most important regulatory challenges for your solution, and maybe even uh, in a broader sense. Yes, we, we face uh, uh, like uh, <laughs> the same problem that Simono faces. The directive, uh, it's a European directive 9, 944. It's not uh, transposed, uh, needs to be transposed and it's not transposed already in Portugal. So it has in some European uh, countries, uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, but not still in Portugal. So this poses some some kind of regulatory uh, regulatory issues that uh, we, we we need to tackle. Um, it's uh, but we feel that it's important to to, to advance and also this uh, research uh, this this project give uh, good insights and well uh, we uh, with the politics will we we will get there. Okay. Yeah, that uh, indeed it's a 
quite necessary these transpositions. Uh, Rui, Ricardo, do you have on, on your side something to complement? We also see uh, other regulatory challenges, maybe also similar to the ones that uh, Tommaso mentioned, from more from the TSO perspective. Well, uh, what Suzette has mentioned is correct. So we are missing uh, the, some mm, political rules about the, the role of the, of the DSO in, in this aspect. And also there is missing to, uh, also a figure of the aggregator in Portugal, okay? But I feel that this, this topic uh, needs to be uh, fixed in, in the next time, but of course, as you know, it always in the Mediterranean countries, it always takes a, a little more uh, time to implement, uh, and uh, but we have to wait. Thank you. Yeah, maybe then as a, a challenger, Mike, because you mentioned one of the challenges was that actually that regulatory framework changed <laughs> during your uh, demo at setup and and uh, yeah, I would say uh, yeah, the, the demo continuation. So. Are you now happy with the uh, existing regulatory framework or do you see still some remaining challenges that are not solved yet? I see still remaining challenges. What uh, changed was that uh, um, generation, renewable generation, now is mandatory above 100 kV installed capacity to be mandatory to be part of this process of congestion management uh, and some voltage control and so on. But um, now if we look further, right next to this uh, generation could be a consumption. That is, if uh, uh, beforehand informed, it's cheaper, more cost efficient to use in flexibilities than this generation. And that's still not part in a, in a, on the same level in this uh, German regulation. Um, first, we have to curtail and do everything with generation. And if we have still issues with it, then we can use uh, consumption load um, in this area of congestion management in this process. And it would be good to uh, make it on the same level to use both options uh, in the same process. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, it's clear that there are still some regulatory challenges, but also that we expect that the coming uh, months and years, uh, things might change and settle. And uh, indeed, I agree that uh, having this uh, cooperation in projects between TSOs and TSOs, it's actually uh, providing very interesting, useful input to the regulators. Um, but maybe then zoom in to a specific topic, which is of uh, high debate. That's of course how the um, markets and, and products typically for system services, how they will evolve. Now typically what are the, the upcoming changes on, on the level of market design? And then we, we see a lot of happening at the level of congestion management. So what are according to you, the elements that, that will change uh, in the coming years? And uh, maybe you can also see, or explain how your solution uh, can benefit from that or how your solution is not compatible with those expected changes. So um, maybe first uh, going to uh, Simone. So how do you see that, uh, the relation between your solution and the evolutions on level of market design? Um, looking at uh, an, a more wider uh, vision, uh, we uh, expect uh, that, um, that there will be the need to open the market uh, uh, of services uh, um, by the uh, improvement of the participation of new resources uh, in order to diversify the offer uh, and uh, adapt it uh, uh, to the increasing uh, 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 amount of generation in, uh, in general. Uh, for sure, uh, we can uh, look uh, at the um, at new uh, roles uh, that can be identified uh, in the in the market uh, in in general. Uh, consider that uh, looking at our demonstrator, um, all the processes uh, starting from the bit of optimization, uh, the aggregation, uh, the disaggregation uh, are uh, uh, carried out uh, by the DSO, but only for the purposes of the demonstrator. Uh, 
uh, in uh, our uh, uh, vision uh, in, in the future, uh, this role, part of these roles, uh, uh, some of these roles uh, can be taken by other actors. So we can see also the participation of new actors uh, in, uh, in the market uh, um, in general. Uh, so um, we expect uh, that uh, uh, in the future, uh, there would be the, um, the, the increase of the participation of REST in, in that market and uh, uh, the, the presence of new roles uh, in it. And the experience of the Italian demo uh, can be also useful to demonstrate that it is possible to extend and incentivate the participation of new different resources in the flexibility market. Um, Tommaso, do you uh, agree with that? Do you see, uh, do you see other points? Um... Um, yeah, I mean, I I do agree with uh, what Simona said in terms of uh, roles, possibility of having new roles into the uh, serious service market. Uh, what I see uh, is that the centralized approach, at least in Italy, is going to be, let's say, kept in place. Uh, like the option of having multiple local flexibility markets, eventually one for each DSO area, uh, it's, I mean, to my uh, personal opinion, something is not going to be working, at least in the uh, very uh, short to medium term. And the need for a central entity that manages the uh, flexibility request eventually for local needs and system needs is going to be, let's say, stay uh, where it is now. So what's going to happening uh, to be happening in the, in the future uh, in our idea is that the... Um, let's say local needs are going to be uh, procured by the central service, uh, the central service procurer, which uh, might be, I mean, which is the, the, the TSO, the national TSO. So the, uh, the DSO needs at local uh, punctual level are just uh, be considered as, let's say, a share of the overall uh, flex service uh, needs, flexibility need. Uh, a national level. So what's uh, probably going to happen is that there is going to be, let's say, the definition, the correct model, uh, coordination model. And what's going to be very important for us is that the constraints are correctly, let's say, accounted for. Um, the definition of where to place constraints, so where to put the interface between a TSO and the DSO is, of course, of utmost importance. Uh, because, of course, is um, something is to be speaking about the physical interface, something else about speaking the, say, virtual interface, and might change in a dynamic way um, between the TSO and DSO. So these two topics, of course, are going to be determining how the interaction is going to be uh, looking like. But the need for a central entity that procures flexibility for local needs and system needs, uh, to my opinion, is going to be staying, at least for a bit. Okay. Of course, this, this doesn't mean that the DSOs can't procure flexibility in a bilateral way with the asset owners. So uh, the solution to the problem probably is going to be a mix between market-based interaction between a TSO and DSO in the overall ancillary service market. But that doesn't mean that the DSO can use uh, I don't know, flexibility contracts with the asset owners at local level. Uh, tariffs and so on and also a solution, a part of the solution uh, to the problem we're going to be facing very soon. Yeah. If the scenarios are correct, of course. Okay, let me just ask to the other panelists, uh, do you have something in addition to that where you see that uh, from your country perspective, um, uh, it will be different or that uh, you expect other changes on, on the level of the market design? Uh, maybe Suzette? <laughs> Uh, when uh, well in Portugal, and uh, as I said, the, the the regulation hasn't yet been transposed. We are uh, the main DSO uh, uh, in Portugal. The um, this uh, uh, distributed energy sources are mainly at the DSO agreed. What we try to do in the US Flex project and the and it work is at the interconnection point. And uh, with security, cost efficiently, we could address the TSO's needs in order to 
uh, to to suppress uh, to to we could do that and we could do that and in a, in a, uh, real time in the 15 minutes it's what uh, what we are uh, demonstrating so of course it, it can be a, a different scenario depending on the reality from country to country but i think it's a uh, uh, and, and this uh, directive already gives a common, a common, uh, a common uh, approach. Uh, but uh, well, uh, uh, the, these projects are important, and, and this one for us, it, it was important that uh, because of what we could, uh, in fact, demonstrate it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're close to an end, so we just have a final question also for Ricardo. Um, yeah, for the more, uh, I would say also a research perspective, what, according to you, is the next challenge not addressed for TSO, DSO coordination that we should tackle? In addition to all the regulatory and market design points. Not addressed? Uh, or, yeah, I, I, I mean, from my side, I believe it's, it, there's a still room to, to, to go on these TSO, DSO coordination. And the models for the for this coordination are definitely one of the areas that need to be researched and uh, worked on because there are multiple uh, models that are being addressed and that are being uh, studied. But and and even in some uh, in some other projects, they are being demonstrated as well. Uh, uh, and this is definitely one of the key issues that needs to be solved because uh, we need we need a a standardized and uh, European level uh, defined model, so the all the TSOs and DSOs they can uh, coordinate based on that model and based on the on the characteristics of their own systems. But the model should be broad enough to to be accommodated with all the the characteristics around the around Europe. So yeah. Okay. With that, I think it's a good challenge to continue these nice and interesting projects with TSOs, DSOs, and the research community. Um, there is my, what's one specific question from the Q&A asking if we could have the recordings of these webinars. I think Marianne, the answer there is yes, that these recordings will be available. Yes, I confirm. Uh, all recordings from the three webinars will be available and uh, uh, the links to the websites where they will be available will be given. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then I think that the only thing we can do is thanks all the speakers and uh, Osmosa and the Assistflex project to make this uh, webinar uh, happening. And obviously also the support team behind the scenes that uh, make sure that everything uh, functioned smoothly. So also thank you for all the attendees for uh, being there today with us. I would say uh, check out the, the webinars and in case there are additional questions, you can always contact uh, the different uh, people here also, also on the slide, or you can go directly to the project pages of these projects. So thanks for your attention. I would say have a nice day and hopefully see you soon in Rio. Thank you. you thank too. you all, bye. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.